Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. I should like- All right, welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding in love. And today we are talking about mononormativity and non-monogamy in art and pop culture. I am so excited. This is like the name of a college course that I would have taken. <laughs> I like that's that's how I, I'm like, oh, I am so here for it. But before we introduce our absolutely fabulous guest today, a reminder that the Elizabeth Cunningham show is live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page and is then aired on YouTube and pretty much any platform that you can listen to for podcasts every Thursday. All links for that are in the show notes. So on today's episode, we will be talking with Krista Varela Pussell about mononormativity and non-monogamy in art and pop culture. Krista is a writer who leads a book club for Polly Pages, reading texts fundamental to the non-monogamous community. At the beginning of the pandemic, she began Polly in Place, a community blog with her polycule, and since then has become passionate about increasing the visibility and representation of non-monogamy and polyamory in literature. She has been featured on podcasts such as Normalizing Non-Monogamy, Practicing Polyamory, and Poly Uncensored. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, me too. Like I said, this this topic, mononormativity, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to read it. Mononormativity and non-monogamy in art and pop culture. Seriously, like I was like, oh, I would take a college course that was that. I was like, <laughs> that is that. I would choose that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, if I ever get back into teaching, I will definitely pitch a course <laughs> on that. Please oh, do. <laughs> and then let me know. Maybe I'll just enroll as a student so I can take your course. <laughs> I would do it. I love that. Um, yeah, and I, I want to, you know, I love to kind of lay the foundation of what we're talking about in the first segment of the show. And so what is mononormativity? What does that mean? Uh, well, mononormativity is the way in which um, monogamy just kind of um, has has become the default or the standard in our culture and everything that we sort of look at, um, we look at through the lens of, of monogamy, that, which doesn't allow room for, you know, alternative lifestyles or, or anything like that. God, yeah, like the default setting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, got that. And then what do you mean by non-monogamy? Uh, by non-monogamy, I just mean kind of the overall larger umbrella that um, captures all sorts of different kinds of lifestyles, whether it's swinging, polyamory, something in between. Um, when, whenever I'm talking about non-monogamy, I'm talking about it in general, which I think encapsulates a lot of different, um, different types. Okay, great. Awesome. And then we're talking about, you know, it, we said um, pop culture and art or art and pop culture, but you do really focus on literature. Um, uh, so uh, like, so what do you like pop culture? Tell me a little bit more about like, what do you mean by um, pop culture? When I say pop culture, I mean the things that we are consuming on a regular basis, whether that's books, articles, movies, uh, music, any any kinds of media that we're sort of exposed to um, on on a regular basis. For me, I, I tend to focus on literature and books because that's my background. Um, but ever since becoming Polly, I've really just noticed the ways in which um, 
mononormativity is just kind of the standard for a lot of the things that that we consume in the media. Yeah, and I think that when you start to look through and that that's kind of, you know, it sounds like that's what spurred a lot of your work and what you do is that you you do see that like you're like, oh, yeah, um, we only talk about, you know, couples, we only talk about, you know, one person being with another person exclusively, that's it. Those are the only types of relationships that are represented when there are all these other types of relationships um, that are possible. And then, yeah, when you consume that in uh, your everyday life, it does become like inundating. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think for me personally, it was um, really difficult when I became poly because I, I, I like to read. I like to read stories as a way to learn things. And of course, yeah. there there are kind of the, the standard poly self-help books, you know, more than two, ethical slut, kind of those foundational texts that that everybody turns to when they when they open up. But um, you know, I I learned so much from from reading stories. And I feel like it would have benefited me so much more to just be able to read more books uh, written by people who had had been through it. And and so, um, you know, that is that is something that I'm I'm thinking about a lot when when I I, I think about how I want to contribute to <laughs> to the the poly and, and non monogamy community in some way. Yeah, well, that's that makes total sense. And then you started your blog. Yeah, yeah. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, my polycule at the time, um, we were all just kind of meeting up on Zoom and trying to stay stay connected, stay together. And um, those weekly meetups turned into kind of this idea for a website, a, a blog. Um, and so, in, yeah, in the summer of 2020, we, we launched this blog um, that sort of took a few different iterations. It, it began sort of on the website, and then we turned to Instagram, um, which is where we found a lot of people really resonating with the things that we were posting. And, and the, the vision for it as a whole was to turn it into this bigger community blog where polyamorous and non-monogamous folks um, were contributing from all over about their experiences in the pandemic. Um, and so we found that people were really responding to us on Instagram and 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 sharing their stories um, back when when we were we were posting about our experiences. And, and so um, it was really cool to kind of find that niche of, of folks who who really just wanted to to talk about what they were going through. Yeah, I, and I think, and stories are so powerful. You know, like you said, I, you're not, you are absolutely not alone in learning from people's stories. I mean, stories are, stories show what's possible. You know, stories are just like, yeah, I'm just like you and I I do this thing and it's totally great. And sometimes I mess up, but then it's okay again. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, when you think about it, that's how, that's how we learn as kids. We, you know, we read lots of different stories, fables, fairy tales, some of them that have, you know, kind of these morals to them. Um, and storytelling as a way of learning is, um, is just kind of, I think, innate to us as humans. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that you can find plenty of evidence. <laughs> I can think you can find an overwhelming amount of evidence um, for stories as being innate to our own experience as human beings. So I want to ask you, why is, why for you, I think this is like a broader question, but I also would love to hear your own personal answer as well. Um, why is visibility and representation and polyamory and non-monogamy important? I mean, I think just for for the reasons we were just talking about, um, not only is it a way for people who are exploring polyamory and non-monogamy for the first time to to learn more about it, to learn what has worked for people and what has not worked, but also for for folks who love people who are poly and and non-monogamous to fully understand, you know, uh, fully understand the. Um, the lifestyle or the ways in which those people conduct their relationships. And so I think, 
you know, if, if you want to learn something, there has to be, there has to be examples of it and, and diverse examples of it. You know, I, I think, um, as, as much as I would love to see, uh, lots of, positive representations of polyamory and non-monogamy, we also need to account for the fact that polyamory and non-monogamy can be messy. And not every every example that you see on TV or that you read in a book is going to be perfect. Just like no monogamous, you know, we don't expect all monogamous examples uh, of relationships in, in the media that we consume to be perfect. Um, and so I think by by showing just the, the wide range of experiences experiences that people have um, within non-monogamy, you know, people will will learn more about it and and be just open and more receptive to it as a whole. Yeah, uh, I I could not agree more. I think that for my own self, when I first heard other people share their stories of being polyamorous was when I like I all I already felt like really good about myself and my relationship style and how I was being and like all of that stuff like I was good with it but there was this sense of like coming home or like like um you know that feeling that you get when you're like oh like everything it's like it's all okay like I don't it doesn't have to just be me right like it's not just me being this way and when you do hear those stories of other people, it's not just, it's not just for your own like validation of who you are, but it's just like the validation that in having other people feel the way that you do, that it's, you don't have to defend it. It's almost like you don't have to defend it anymore. You're like, no, this is other people feel this way too. It's completely normal. Like I don't have to defend myself all the time because other people feel this way too. Yeah, exactly. And one of my favorite parts about going out on dates with uh, with new folks, whether those are group dates with my husband or or just by myself, is hearing people's stories. Like, I love asking, how did you get into polyamory or non-monogamy? That's one of my favorite questions because every answer is different and unique. And I just, I love learning how, how everybody comes into it. Oh, that's so beautiful. All right. We are going to take a really quick break. And then when we get back from the break, I do want to dig a little bit more into um, why, I mean, not necessarily like why we don't see, uh, you know, more polyamory and non-monogamy, because I feel like that answer is a little bit obvious. Um, uh, but also like, why is that? And what are the impacts of that? What are the impacts of us not seeing that representation? So we just talked about why it's important. And I would love to talk about like the impacts of like that not being the case necessarily. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about when we get talk about when we get back from break. And we'll see y'all in a second. All right. Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham show, courageously expanding in love. And we are here with Krista Varela Posell, and we are talking about uh, mononormativity and non-monogamy in uh, pop culture and art. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up in this segment of the show is the impact of not being represented. We just talked about why it's so important to have representation and so I just want to talk about the impact of not that, that, and, and that's what we're experiencing, right? Because there's not a lot of representation. There's more than there was fantastic. Um, but there's still not a lot. Um, so Krista, what do you see? What do you see as the impact of a lack of representation? I mean, I think it just, it makes it more difficult for, for people to, find stories that resonate with them and as you were saying before you know you feel a lot more alone when you can't find other people that are experiencing the same things that that you are and aren't uh aren't experiencing the same hardships and and things like that and and so you know I know for me it's has been um, just really eye-opening to realize 
how how few examples there are out there. Um, I was working in a bookstore a few years ago and I came across, it's a memoir called Vanishing Twins by Leah Dietrich. And that was kind of the first time that I had seen um, a book about non-monogamy like on a bookshelf. Well, I guess I had read Jenny Block's Open like several years earlier. So, so that was, I guess, the first example. But when I was working in this bookstore, you know, I always had my eye out for anything that was related to polyamory and non-monogamy. I was so hungry for reading material that I just, I wanted to find anything that I could. And, you know, I, if, if you go looking, like if you Google uh, fiction that contains polyamory, there are things out there. And I think most notably is N.K. Jemisin's uh, Broken Earth trilogy, I've which I haven't read. Sci-fi and fantasy aren't quite my genres. Um, mm -hmm. But I've been told that particularly the first book in that series, uh, the fifth season, uh, features a polyamorous relationship. No way. Um, yeah. And I've also heard that Becky Chambers' Wayfarer series um, also heavily includes I, polyamory. Yeah, I've heard that as well. I haven't read that, but I somebody told me that somebody was like, oh, I'm really surprised you haven't read it. And I was like, why? And they were like, oh, yeah, there's like polyamory in it. Like, oh, OK, I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, for somebody like me who who doesn't gravitate towards sci fi and fantasy, um, I, I tend to go for more mainstream literary fiction, nonfiction, things like that. Um, so it it's really challenging when I'm trying to come up with books to recommend to people um, because, you know, things like uh, things like the Broken Earth trilogy or the Wayfarer series, th those are only going to resonate with with a few you select people right. and and so when you don't have these um these representations or examples in broader or different genres of of literature you know it gets it gets really hard to uh, to be able to show people you know this this is who I am and this is what I do and and uh and these are the the kinds of relationships that that I foster so um yeah I, I think the impact for me personally has just been sort of like struggling to to be able to show the important people in my life who you know are, I'm not in intimate relationships with um yeah, the, yeah. the ways in which I I conduct conduct those relationships and, and so I've taken to writing about it myself but you know I'm I'm only one person and I certainly don't have any books on the shelves yet so <laughs> yet yet yeah. there will be a day I'm excited I'm excited for that <laughs> yeah well and you know to to your point it's like it's hard for the individual who is non-monogamous to see see things for themselves right like it took me until I was in my early 20s to even um, be okay with the fact that I was attracted to and loved multiple people at a time like I really thought that there was something wrong with me before that and so not having representation in mainstream media and you don't see that and you hear the exact opposite of that it's hard not to feel wrong you know, and it's easy to feel that aloneness and that isolation and that doubt in yourself. And, and then, yeah, I mean, excellent point as well, too, is that like, and then when you're trying to explain it to people, um, then it's like, it's hard to point people into a direct, I mean, that was why I started my first podcast was because I was like, I'm literally explaining this over and over and over again and I just wish that people understood or at the very least I could just give them this audio and not have to have this conversation over and over and over again and, and that's honestly why I started my first podcast was because I wanted people in my life to understand who I was yeah totally and I and I think this o overlaps a lot with um what I've experienced as a queer person too it just it gets exhausting to to have to explain yourself over and over and over again and even though I've been in a hetero presenting relationship for half of my life now you know I've been 
I've been queer that whole time, but it just, it's, it's hard for people to understand. You know, when I came out publicly a few years ago, my mom was a little bit confused by it and, and thought that meant that I was like leaving my husband for a woman. And, Mm -hmm. and so it just, when you're poly and queer, there's kind of this, this, sort of double whammy explanation that that you have to give over and over and over again. Um, and so I feel like if there are are more representations of non-monogamy out there, then it it won't feel like such like such a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well and I feel like so many polyamorous relationships or poly or at, at some some level in your polycule, um level might not be the right word. Some some section of your polycule um is most likely queer and so there's a lot of overlap there and so there is there is kind of like this multi-layered you know um thing to explain and when something is multi-layered like that then there's a lot of different ways in which people can misunderstand um or misconstrue or you know make up you know, their own decisions about things based off of the, you know, our mononormative culture (laughs) Um, rather than um, inquire more or do the work to understand. And it kind of, it, it just loops back into itself, right? It just feeds right back into, well, then we don't have a lot of resources for people who are trying to understand. And so it really does feed back into that, that loop, that impact of um, not having resources, although, and maybe, maybe I'm, I'm living in a bubble now since I've been working in this, in this field for like years, I'm like, I feel like there's so much more resources now. (laughs) And then, and and then I kind of go outside of the bubble and I'm like, oh wait, no one, very, very few people still understand. Okay. 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 There's still work to do. Okay. I got it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think because I've been sort of tangentially in the the poly content creator space for for a couple of years now, you know, it it seems clear and obvious to me, but then sometimes, you know, when I meet meet people who are new um to to polyamory and non-monogamy, you know, they they don't know the 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 same books that I do that you know just seem kind of obvious or, or second nature to um to recommend to people. So it's it's always important for me to kind of keep that in mind that even for people within within our community, those those resources aren't always apparent. Yeah, and I have conversations with people on a regular basis where they're like, I just don't even know where to look. And then I like point them in all of these directions where I'm like, oh man, I feel like I say that those things like over and over again. Like I feel like, oh my God. I mean, Jessica Fern's book, Poly Secure, I feel like I talk about that like almost every single day. <laughs> I'm like, have you read Poly Secure by Jessica Fern? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that one's always at the top of my list and recommending to people and honestly I think that even people in monogamous relationships could benefit by reading yeah. it because they're just there's just so much there in terms of building safe and secure relationships whether or not they're open that everybody can learn from oh yeah I I completely agree with you. Uh, I I've absolutely recommended it to monogamous people. I'm like, okay, don't get thrown off by the name, but like, you definitely need to read Poly Secure by Jessica Fern. <laughs> yeah, because it is. It's just, and you know, and I feel like I've I've talked about this before too. Is that in learning about um, uh, like non-monogamous and polyamorous relationships, is that you learn so much about the nuance of relationships and uh, like how people can be and what's possible and things that come up for people when they're challenged in relationships that a lot of you know non-monogamous resources are great for everyone just because of how in-depth they go with like what gets brought up and what's possible in relationships. So yeah, well, we're going to, we are going to go on another break and we're kind of turning this corner into, yeah, like what is, um, um, 
like, I want to hear your recommendations. I want to hear like, let's create a world. Let's, let's talk about, let's create a world where we do have representation, right? Let's have that conversation. Sounds great. Okay. Perfect. All right. We'll do that when we get back from break. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham show, Courageously Expanding in Love. And we are talking with Carista Varela Pascal about non-monogamy, mononormativity, and uh, pop culture and art. And it's been epic so far. I am assuming that it's going to continue to be yeah. epic. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? You know? <laughs> <laughs> So Krista, are you ready to solve all of the um, representation problems in polyamory in the next 15 minutes? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> 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 okay, but let but it, in in all seriousness, I do want to talk about you know what is what is possible here in having representation. Um, I have my own uh, experiences and like hangups about um the representation of like non-monogamy in mainstream culture and uh, i'm sure that you have um similar similar opinions um so i do want to talk about what do you i guess this is where i want to go what do you see happening now in the representation that is here and what's missing like what would level up the representation? Well, I think what I, what I tend to see a lot of, particularly on like television and even in movies to some extent, is when polyamory or non-monogamy is presented, it is in the most palatable way possible, usually in the form of a triad uh, where there's there's one man at the center of it and he's he's got, you know, his two women. Um, but you know, there are so many different kinds of relationship structures, so many different types of polycules <laughs> that that exist out there. Um, so, you know, it's it's really it's hard not to roll my eyes whenever I see like, oh, there's just another triad, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was this there was this film that came out, I think it was last year um, on HBO called There's No Eye in Threesome. Um, I don't know if I you haven't seen that. I, hadn't, I actually I haven't even heard of that. That's so interesting. Yeah, so it's on it's on HBO, I think, still. Um, and it's it's a documentary that follows this couple as they they open up um, and they are living separately for a while. Um, and the woman falls in love with somebody else, um, which is sort of like a becomes a, a source of contention because they originally opened up because he wanted to explore his buy side. And so there's, there's sort of this twist at the end that I won't give away, but <laughs> it was just, it was sort of this interesting example when my husband and I watched it of like how to not open up in the best way. <laughs> like these are, these are all examples of like what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, it's hard when I see those those types of things out there because yes, I want I want there to be representations of of people who are making mistakes and showing that, you know, polyamory doesn't have to be perfect. It can be messy. But at the same time, it's it's hard when there are those examples out there that I think reinforce a lot of people's stereotypes, negative stereotypes about what non-monogamy looks like. Um that you know i i would love to see just more examples of mm -hmm. more examples of of people in polyamorous or non-monogamous relationships where that isn't the focus or that isn't like their main personality trait or thing about them that that you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know i think i think what what would be most exciting to me is when we see a poly character on tv that is just allowed to exist and and their polyamory isn't made the butt of a joke or doesn't become this major plot point for the show itself right is that like yeah that's not the centering thing about them 
the other example that I see I, that I've seen most recently is um have you seen the show how to build a sex room yes <laughs> okay I have some interesting things, interesting uh, opinions about that show. I, I think it's a good show for everyone who's listening. I do think it's a good show. It definitely warrants, you know, a watch for sure. And I love um, Melanie Rose, the woman who's like the designer um, of the sex rooms. I think that she's just absolutely delightful um, as a human being. I'm <laughs> like, I want to meet her and know her. Like, she's so cool. Um, but uh the they did have a polycule they had a family of seven polycule um and uh, which I was excited about because it wasn't it wasn't a triad so I was like yes score not a triad so excited about that um but I was also and maybe I'm just sensitive because it's like you know as someone who's polyamorous I want polyamory to be like represented really well and like not be misconstrued and all of that stuff um, so I'll recognize my own bias in this. Um, but I, uh, there was a part of me that was like, like not crazy about how it was represented because it was more in the context of like, there's just this group of people that all have a bunch of kinks together and get together, you know, and have these kinks. They did have some conversations about how they feel about each other. And that was really good. And of course you can't like explain the full dynamic of a polycule in like a 20 minute segment, you know, of a show. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's the most, most recent one that I, I had seen about it. Um, it's, yeah, seen as far as like representation of like polyamory in media. Yeah, it's definitely interesting that you bring up that example. And and um, I haven't watched the entire series. I just watched the episode with with the polycule in it. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I think it was interesting how the the room got catered towards everybody, you know, there, there, there was the one person who just really loved to cuddle and wanted just like a big bed for, for cuddling. And then there was, um, you know, the, uh, I think like the main woman in the polycule that they focused on who like loved being like locked up. And so there, there yeah. was, you know, the little cage for her to get into and, and things right. like that. So like in terms of the room that actually got designed, you know, it seemed to accommodate the, the entire polycule Right. And, and the ba the bathroom, you know? <laughs> yeah, the bathroom. <laughs> um, you have to watch the episode to figure out what we're talking about. So we'll just I'm just gonna leave it there. Just the bathroom. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I agree, it's it's so hard to capture the nuance of all of those different dynamics um and all of the relationships that exist within it um in you know what is essentially what like a 45 minute show and and that is split right. between another another couple that they are um building a room for so mm -hmm. yeah there is sort of like I think this voyeuristic element that people are probably watching to see like oh you know this is just a bunch of like sex crazed folks who who just like want to have orgies all the time and <laughs> you know in a room about a sex show like I guess it's it's a little hard to to talk about things other than sex but um i i agree with you it it, it was it was difficult to to sort of like get a sense of every everyone in that show and and kind of see into their humanity beyond just like here is just a bunch of people in in relationships that are fucking each other <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah pretty much um, well, what books do you, what, what is going well as far as representation goes, or what would you either what's going well, or what would you like to see more of? Um, well, as a nonfiction writer myself, I would love to see more memoirs written by polyamorous and non-monogamous folks. Um, there, there was a book that came out, uh, last year, uh, called Open by Rachel Krantz. Um, and, uh, I really loved, uh, her, it was a memoir that combined journalism and, um, and interviews and, uh, just kind of her own personal, uh, journal writings of her experience 
going into polyamory and, and her first non-monogamous relationship with somebody who turned out to be rather abusive. But, um, you know, this this is one of the, the first books I have seen that has been published by like a major imprint um, that talk, that is explicitly about polyamory and non-monogamy. And, and so I would just, yeah, personally, I would love to see more memoirs by, by people being published on the subject, but, but also, um, as I was saying before, like, I would, I would love for there just to be examples of polyamory in books or in TV shows where there are poly people that just exist and that is not their main personality trait. The central focus or tension of that character isn't about their polyamory but it's just you know that's one one facet about them yeah it's just like a part of who they are yeah yeah and and you know I would love I would love a rom-com that couldn't be solved by using polyamory (laughs) (laughs) so one of my one of my favorite movies when I was like in my late teens early 20s was serendipity uh with John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale. Yeah, I love that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I had, I had watched it, I don't know, a dozen times when I was younger and then hadn't watched it for, for a very long time. And so watched it last year with a couple of my partners, one who hadn't seen it before and watching it again, now that I'm Polly, for, for those of you who haven't seen it, John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale have this meet cute at the beginning of the movie where they are trying to buy the same pair of gloves for for their respective partners for Christmas and then they they go out and get coffee and of course there's chemistry there but they can't get together because they're with other people and so you know polyamory would would solve would solve the plot of that movie in the first 15 minutes but of course you know that's that's not interesting so (laughs) I I would love for for there to be a rom-com that exists um where you know polyamory doesn't just make everything make everything magically better (laughs) or or I guess where polyamory isn't the obvious solution to uh to the central conflict yeah yeah absolutely I'm like imagining a movie where it's like they're already polyamorous like one person from one polycule meets another person from another polycule and then like part of the romantic comedy is like each polycule like trying to get you know trying to make their relationship better or something like that I can see a lot of like humor in that you gotta have like all you know the the some people who are like um, some of the partners who are just like the stylists or something like that and some of the people who are like the planners <laughs> and then like some of the people who you know they're like trying to get the other you know the other one together or something like that I'm just making this up and it, if anybody's gonna steal this idea will you please give me a million dollars when it goes viral? Who, who can we get to produce this <laughs> that's what I want to know what are we what are we gonna do about this all right <laughs> <laughs> we are going to take one last break before we um, wrap up the show. Um, and everybody, I would love to, if anybody wants to like write in to the show, you can write into love at Elizabeth Um, You can give your resources. Um, you can also, I would also love to hear your rom-com polyamorous rom-com ideas. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> just dance on dance on to the show <laughs> all right welcome back to the elizabeth cunningham show courageously expanding in love oh i have absolutely adored this topic today about mononormativity non-monogamy representation uh, um in pop culture and art this is, yeah. And, and like, I think I, I, I say this every single episode, I'm like, oh my God, we could just literally talk about this for hours and hours and hours, just like scratching the surface. I really hope one of the things that I hope that people get just out of watching my show in general is that you get to see something for yourself where you're like, I want to explore that more. That sounds really fun for me, or that sounds really important to me and that you go and like explore it even more. So that's what I, that's what I hope. Um, uh, but 
in, uh, I, I would love to know your recommendations. That's, this is the question I've been waiting for. The question, <laughs> the question on everyone's mind, Krista, what are your recommendations <laughs> um, for books that feature polyamory and non-monogamy? Yeah, so the two that I mentioned already, Vanishing Twins by Leah Dietrich and Open by Rachel Krantz, um, are two that I've really enjoyed in the last um, few years on the subject. They're they're both memoirs. Vanishing Twins is a little bit more lyrical, um, and and we have some some interesting um, things about like ballet and, um, and art in, in with the, uh, experience of the writers, um, foray into non-monogamy, but, um, and, and as, as I said, open with Rachel Kranz, it's a little bit more of a, like, journalistic approach into her, um, her first non-monogamous relationship um, and there, there are also other memoirs out there that, um, you know, aren't, aren't super well known, but like My Life on the Swing Set by Cooper Beckett, who also has like a poly podcast. Um, I think he compiled like uh, some of his best blog posts that he wrote while he was, um, you know, transitioning into, I think, swinging and then non like polyamory um, and, and put them together in a book. Um, and there, there are a lot of people out there that also self-publish. Um, so there are, there are things out there, both fiction and nonfiction that you can find. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, sci-fi fan, N.K. Jemison's uh, broke an earth trilogy highly recommend um even though i haven't read it myself she as a writer is just fabulous um as far as other forms of media go i i've recently come to hear that what we do in the shadows and our flag means death both have some really interesting um representations of, of non-monogamy i'm just adding all of these things to the list of of uh shows that i will never have time to watch <laughs> but but yeah those might get bumped up to the top of my list um now knowing that but um yeah there's also a movie that came out um for last year's Sundance Festival mm. called uh, Ma Belle My Beauty and that one um I haven't watched yet but it features um it at, at its core, uh, I think a, a polyamorous triad, um, but not not a traditional triad from what I understand. So, um, you know, there you can find non-monogamy in, in certain pockets of, of pop culture for sure. You, you just have to do a little bit of digging. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that, and that's, you know, we talk about like mononormativity and just like wanting to normalize non-monogamy like that and we haven't said that we haven't said that explicit phrase like normalizing non-monogamy but that's that's really what we're talking about and I think that that's so perfect that yeah like you can find non-monogamy in any pocket because people who are non-monogamous are everywhere like they're in every walk of life they're every age gender race ethnicity able-bodied disable-bodied like any all any any category of identity or area of life you know class <laughs> you know socioeconomic status you know, so anywhere you look you could find non-monogamy but it like as we said it is it does take some digging right now currently at where we're at it does take some digging, but as more and more start to trickle out that there is this, I see a future of normalizing non-monogamy. I do. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely an optimist. I feel like things are trending in that, in that direction. Um, but in the meantime, it's just, it's always something that's kind of at the, the forefront of my brain whenever I am, looking at something that portrays relationships in any way, shape, or form, I'm like, okay, how, how is mononormativity, like, informing how this is being portrayed, and always just wishing that there were, things were just a little bit different, so, you know, yeah. showcasing a little bit of difference um, to, to incorporate more, more diversity. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, yeah. 
All right, we're going to transition to the last couple of questions that I end with on the show. So what does love mean to you? Oh, wow. That's that's a big question. I think love means... <laughs> Love is a verb, right? Like that that's kind of a cliche that love is isn't just something that you feel for somebody else. It's it's a it's a collection of actions. And I I think that love gets expressed in many different forms and many different kinds of relationships. And one of the things that I love about being polyamorous is the ways in which I get to express different kinds of love through different actions with different people, because, you know, that is, that is what their love language is. Thank you. If people get nothing else, what do you hope that they got out of this episode? Um, I think what I hope people will get out of this episode is that, um, first of all, if, you are a writer trying to write about your experiences in polyamory or non-monogamy, you're not alone. Um, I have been doing it for a few years now. And, um, you know, if that is you and you, you want to get in touch, I would love to exchange work sometime. <laughs> I, I'm always looking for, for people to, um, to share that kind of thing with, because I, I think that, um, at least in my previous experiences, share, sharing work with other people makes my writing better. It, it has helped me improve the writing of other friends that I've worked with. And, and, and so, you know, there are communities out there to, to help people write and, and tell and share their stories. Um, but also, I hope that people just realize how, how much of a need or desire there is for more um more representations of polyamory and non-monogamy in in our culture beautiful thank you and uh, i want everybody to know that if you want to get a hold of krista uh that all of their links are in the uh show notes and so just go down click on the links there's i think we put your uh, personal Instagram, but also the um, Polly in Place Instagram as well. And then also the link to your essays too. Um, so we have all, all the things that Krista talked about today. You can find them in the show links. And Krista, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been just wonderful having you here. Thanks so much. I've had a great time. Oh, beautiful. And thank you everyone who is listening right now, watching right now. Remember that on whatever platform you are currently consuming this on to turn on the notification, to hit the like or subscribe button. And if this is something that you feel would resonate with someone that you know, please share this episode. Please be the one in your group, in your life that shares and spreads love. So until next time, which is next Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page. Um, I hope that you all keep loving. You have been listening to The Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on transformationtalkradio.com where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at elizabethannecunningham.com. That's elizabethannecunningham.com.